returning from tea um, at Jared's prompting um, for this panel session, which um, I will be attempting to keep on time so that everyone can get to the bar in time, which is why we're all here. <laughs> um, this panel is all about managing uh, cosmetic tourism claims. I do know what it's about. I just had a moment there where I should go back and check. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. This is as much as you'll be hearing from me. Um, it's really over to these two experts. Tony, <coughs> um, joining us um, from Belgium. She specialises in labour and social law there, including industrial accidents and other personal injury cases. And she's worked on several cases involving Dutch women who have come to Belgium and for breast implants, so it has particular experience in this kind of area. And um, Cheryl, sort of the, the needs no introduction, <laughs> member of the panel, but she is, of course, a partner at Irvin Mitchell, specialising in cross border injury claims, and she has a particular interest in these kinds of claims. And um, after a stellar tenure as chair of the Young, Young Lawyers Group, she's now sitting on the executive board, and um, I'm sure will be a familiar face to most people. So I'm going to be asking um, the panellists about some particular areas, have they managed these claims, um, particularly focusing on some practical tips and learnings from their own work and, and cases. Um, and obviously, because Shawnee's here, we'll have a particular focus on what if you've got a case of surgery in Belgium and um, what's going to apply then. Belgium is, of course, an attractive destination for treatment abroad. It's easy to reach from the UK generally has a reputation for high standards and many full of English speakers. The internet tells me, so who knows, but it tells me that on average, patients save around 50% uh, on their treatment in Belgium and that over 55,000 uh, people travel to Belgium specifically for medical treatment every year. And of course, following Brexit, there are added complexities um, for those seeking redress when things have gone wrong during surgery abroad all things that have been touched on um, in the panel so far. As practitioners, we have to work harder now to establish jurisdiction in England to bring these claims, asking ourselves, is there a package? Does the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act apply? Could I claim under Section 75 of the Consumer Credit Act? Um, it, it's opened a, a whole other field for us to consider. So let's, um, with that in, 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 on the floor, let's get some guidance from Cheryl and Shawnee on how we can best manage these claims. <laughs> the first thing that I want to ask Cheryl and, and Shawnee about, um, and maybe Cheryl, I'll start with you, is at the very beginning, when something lands on your desk, it's a potential tourism case, medical tourism case abroad. Um, and I think we're happy to expand this from medical as well as cosmetic cases. When assessing prospects of success at that early stage, what are some of the key factors you'll be considering? Sure, I think it... One of the first things to think about is, as you said, there are <coughs> medical negligence. These are elective surgeries um, and they are very complicated in terms of liability and causation from a medical negligence point of view. Um, what is interesting about these medical tourism cases is that we often find ourselves wrangling with all of the technical issues that we've spoken about today. Um, so if you were going to have a nap, it probably still is relevant, even if you don't do these cases, um, because we actually have a high proportion of jurisdiction challenges, arguments about contractual issues on these cases. And so for that reason, when they first come to us, we have a think about first and foremost, can we bring it in this jurisdiction? And some of the factors that we look towards that are whether there is a consumer contract. Um, and these cases have taught us that actually whether there is a consumer contract isn't as straightforward as it might seem. Um, we have a look at whether there is a jurisdiction clause. And again, that's, that can be complicated as well. In terms of the jurisdiction clauses, um, we've got into some really um, nitty gritty conversations about contracts um, that sort of takes us you know, right back to where we all started with our education. Um, when is the contract formed? Where is the jurisdiction clause? Because often you have conversations about what the surgery is, what it will entail, and payment and then much further down the line sometimes in a foreign language you'll have a, a jurisdiction clause and the defendant will try and enforce that upon the claimant and so there's an argument actually about whether it is part of the contract if it is is it a valid part did they look at it in the proper language did they understand what they were signing and all these sorts of things um, in terms of the consumer contract we've had uh, some interesting discussions and we've had experience where i honestly thought that a person, no matter what her profession, going to Belgium for breast implants would be a consumer in that scenario, in that she's not 
a medical professional. She's seeking a professional to carry out that surgery. But because she was in the adult entertainment, entertainment business, the argument was that this was a commercial business to business contract. Um, and that put a stop to the consumer contract argument. <coughs> That's a really staggering um, <laughs> decision there. <laughs> you know, you have just to kind of, yeah, to, to be undertaking those kinds of risks and mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, surgery. And, and that kind of say. discussion about what she was going to use the surgery for is um, incredibly personal in a business to business context. Yeah, that can't have been, um, <laughs> that can't have been an easy one for client handling, I'm sure, and particularly that outcome. Shawnee, do you have any input there on sort of this? Yeah, we, we already had a little discussion about the B2C, B2B context in Belgium. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was going uh, to, to end with. Thank you. Um, so in Belgium, there's recent case law in, it's from the 9th of March 2018. It's from our highest courts. And they start with making a distinction between uh, the mixed contracts. So in this case, the judge um, was clear that it was mostly professional, but when there's a, a mixed contract and the professional part is less substantial than the private part, you can still put it on the consumer law in Belgium. And most of us, I mean, most of the law is in Belgium. We look at taxes and fiscal uh, reglementation to see if the professional part is more substantial than the private part. So in that way, with taxes and sort of stuff, we can still put it on the consumer law, which was very, very necessary during COVID mm -hmm. after all the problems with uh, cars and all of that. The prices went up and when you were a professional the um garages and and the producers could augment it, the prices of the cars but if you paid taxes as mostly private on that car you can say to the producer that you were still a consumer and the prices couldn't be higher uh, because of the, the production prices. And I think in medical advice, uh, medical devices cases, mm -hmm. the same rules can be applied. So, but in that case, mm -hmm. it was a, a professional yeah. <laughs> case, although I have my uh, questions about that. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what about um, Cheryl, your experience of um, trying to bring these cases in England when they involve Belgium? What's the Belgian approach to jurisdiction? Are they are they kind of up to what do they know what we're up to? Or yeah, some some of them do, and I'm not I'm not talking about the lawyers. The lawyers obviously <laughs> know what we're doing. I'm talking about the surgeons. I think one of the complicating factors in this case was that the surgeon himself had asked the Belgian court for a declaration that he was um, not liable for any injury. So we were in the Belgian courts um, because if these arguments had been had in England, I think it would have been different. Um, but we were in the Belgian court and we were up in arms. It was a case that was issued pre-Brexit. Um, and so um, with the Brussels regulations, we thought it was, um, we thought it was, you know, really out of order that this surgeon was trying to bring the claim in his country because it's very clearly that the consumer has the right to bring the, the claim in her country. Um, and so that does call into question how you deal with these cases. Will a records request alert a surgeon to the fact that you're going to make a claim? Will a letter of claim alert them? Um, if you don't contact them, how do you know who their insurer is? Um, so you've got a lot of different factors at play and you have to sort of draw an experience of specific surgeons and clinics to have an understanding as to whether they might be trying to take these steps and seize jurisdiction. I think now it would be much, much simpler for them to see jurisdiction does not have a chance mm -hmm. to argue against it. Mm -hmm. So definitely something to be to be wary of. And, and what about sort of what kind of evidence you're looking at at this assessment of prospect stage? Maybe if you could talk us through that. Sure. So um, what we would want to see ideally, and think it would be straightforward, would be to see the um, surgical notes. Um, we've had a case that recently um, 
went to trial and was adjourned trial continue later this year and after that that trial was part heard we then got the clinical notes um, because it's incredibly difficult now in that case um, obviously not so crucial because we we plowed ahead to trial um, and we're, we're feeling pretty good at, about it but we would want to see the notes but the reality is you don't often see those and so what you need are experts who are willing to give a view based on the records that you can get these people have often been backwards and forwards in England with practitioners and gather what information you can um, and get somebody at an early stage with an expert view. Um, these are medical negligence cases and so trying to disentangle um, how a person was before and how they are after is no different just because it's a cosmetic surgery claim um, and often trying to disentangle what um, they would have felt about themselves is one of the complicating factors um, and so you have to take a very um, clinical view with the with the right clinicians um, so you, you, your expert is key and your records are key and you can look at doing the procedures that we would do in any other case is there an opportunity to try and compel disclosure via a foreign agent in the foreign country without the risk of seizing jurisdiction so again the, these issues that we come face to face with all cross-border personal injury cases are relevant here um, but trying to get those trying to get those records um, is key. We've had cases that we couldn't get off the ground because we couldn't get records, and claimants, understandably, are very upset about it because it feels like, well, they've done this to me, and they just don't get the records, and they get away with it. But without that evidence, um, obviously, they're unconscious during these procedures. It's very difficult. Um, but there are things um, which I think we'll come on to later in terms of indicators of um, outcomes that just shouldn't happen and um, that your experts can guide you on so you need these these experts who can be objective and give you a steer right at the outset. And surely can you shed any light on why Cheryl has had such a hard time getting disclosure um, in her Belgian cases? Yeah because we don't have some kind of disclosure as a Belgian lawyer when you act for your clients you will just give the evidence that is in favor of your clients. If you have evidence that is not in favor of your client, you will just withhold it as long as you can. And the other party doesn't have the opportunity, uh, like the UK, to do the disclosure and to ask those documents. So for us, especially in medical claims, it's very difficult to get the evidence we need to get the reports to get those surgical notes because they just say we don't have it. And if you can prove that, you, that they really have those notes of you, you can start proving that there must be something that you will never get them. So we can go to the judge and ask for several documents, information we are sure about that the counterparty will have them but if they don't have them and we can't prove or they have them but we can't prove it that they have it then we will never see it and it will never come before a judge in Belgium so in that specific specific situation the experts are very very important because also for medical evidence only the experts get the medical evidence we as lawyers for us, it is very difficult to ask for that evidence. So we can't ask a doctor in Belgium, can we get your clinical notes? They will just say to us, go to the doctor of your client, the patient, that doctor can ask the other doctor to get the notes or the documents. And then that doctor can send it to the patient and then the patient can decide to send it to us. So it really is, a whole tour just to get a view of personal documents that the right of the patient is to see those documents but it's yeah it's really difficult to get them so yeah. I understand yeah. how how difficult it is for uh, UK lawyers to get them I, I really do and knowing all of this and you know this if I'm going to say it at all it's definitely not specifically in relation to surgeons in Belgium you might get the records after several years in question when they were created or if you're getting a full view if you're getting the original contemporaneous records whether they have been um, reviewed prior to being disclosed to you um, it's a it's a real issue yeah it seems signi so significantly different to how we do it here then you're not going to be necessarily trusting everything that that you do get even if you manage to get it so that's a real a real hurdle but kind of again as you say really useful background information to have when you're running one of these cases because it's 
it was really surprising to me when you said that. I said, how do you do your job? <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not something you, you think of at all. Um, and what about any other factor, Cheryl, that, that you look at when, when saying, am I going to take this on? Am I going to run with it? Well, in this glorious uh, post, I'm going to call it a post Brussels world, I forget Brexit. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's all, you know, it's all lovely to look at jurisdiction, whether you're going to be able to get evidence and establish um, negligence. But actually, if you go through all of that and you think about bringing the claim um, over here, are you actually going to be able to enforce your judgment mm -hmm. at the end of it? You know, these are emotionally charged cases for the people involved as a lot of our cases are but i do find with um, the cosmetic surgery claims um, there's a particular attachment to them and a feeling of wrongdoing because they've chosen this person they've done their research the best they can and and they feel um morally wronged by them as well as physically damaged by them um, and so actually whether this whole process is going to be worthwhile for your client is a really important consideration. And in this world that we're in now, we have to make that consideration at a very early stage and get the advice as to whether this is going to be fruitful for your client at all. Mm. And surely, can you address at all what chances Cheryl might have of enforcing in, in Belgium if she gets a judgment here? <laughs> for as much, it's, as much as I understood, there are still some rules and regulations that look like the Brussels one and the Lugana, Lugano convention that we still apply. But if you want to enforce your judgments in Belgium, you have to yeah, use the Belgian law. And for Belgian law, it is a very specific exequatu. It's mean, I, I saw the English terms, a declaration of enforceability before the Belgian course. And you have, you, you do need, officially, you do need the official copy of your judgment in with an official translation. And you have to send that to the court with uh, a specific, um, yeah, specific declaration, I think that's called to ask them to give you the um, exequatur. But I know, and we, we have that problem in our, in our offices, the original copy gets lost in, in yeah, during post, postal, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it in English, but when they send it to us, the official copy gets lost. We never get it. And the court is acting difficult because we, we give another copy and so there's some back and forward discussions about whether a copy is official or not so sending those copies is sometimes difficult but you can still get your judgment executed in Belgium but every court has some specific rules even Antwerp, Brussels, uh, Ghent they all have like specific little differences and I think only Belgian lawyers will know even even I'm not fully aware of the the specific rules in in Brussels mm -hmm. for me it's Antwerp and when I have to go to Antwerp I know what to do I know what, which documents to have how to write the declaration and and all of that but for Brussels it's even better to get a lawyer in Brussels to do it for you so it depends mm -hmm on which part of, of Belgium you have to go to the court. Easy. Yeah, it's a so little country, but we have so many different rules in every street, obviously. But. Okay. That's, I'm very glad I don't practice this afternoon. <laughs> it's really difficult no, 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 it's... I'm really, really challenging. Um, Cheryl, any, any other factors when we're looking at, at assessment of prospects? Yeah. One of the most important ones that we all look at in all these cases um, is what, what law is going to apply. And coming back to what Sarah was saying before about um, establishing jurisdiction and having your evidence on um, what the applicable law will be, um, we have to have a look at that. So we've got an eye on what standards will apply when we're having these initial conversations with experts, you know, which expert are we going to approach, what country are they going to be in, um, because um, we need to know what law will apply to establishing liability. Um, but crucially, um, and I know we all know this because we have nightmares about whether a different limitation period applies, but yeah, what, what limitation period applies, how we're going to interrupt it, 
Um, and again, front loading your conversations with the experts who will be working with you on the case to, to get that information. Um, so you know whether you've got more time, no time, minus time, um, great place to be in. <laughs> and, and again, looking at actually what your causes of action will be, because often the limitation period will be different depending on what cause of action it is that you're seeking to deploy. Mm -hmm. And Shawnee, can you talk us through what, what those will be in Belgium specifically if we've got one of those cases? Yeah, in the UK, you have like the contractual path and the torts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't. We, we do have tort, but it's it's something specific in Belgium. It's like non-contractual, and we use the term fault. Um, and tort is a specific sort of fault that can be put under it. And the contractual limitation, time of limitation, is ten years. And non-contractual, it's five years from the moment uh, the injury occur occurred, but you have still some time to figure out who was the responsible person. So uh, sometimes we, we do have a case now with breast implants, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, there we don't know who the uh, factor, the, mm -hmm. the producer of, of the implants is. So as long as we don't know exactly because they have companies in, in every country and we, we don't know yet which one we have to address. So our time of five years is still interrupted. So it, it doesn't end until we found the right company to sue. So um, that's a non-contractual uh, fact. But with medical uh, devices, we have like a specific Belgian law and there's the, the time of limitation is also 10 years. Mm -hmm. But if we can use that law, we will use it because uh, the evidence to prove uh, the faults, like the tort, is, is very low because there's a... Um, the Belgian law says that there will be a fault unless the surgeon can prove there is no fault. So the liability is very low and the low and the evidence is much more easy to get because the other party has to prove that there is no fault. So we, we like to use that law, but uh, the start date of that is when the product is or the device is manufactured. So a lot of times the 10 years is already passed when the claim arises and, and the uh, yeah the injury arises so a lot of times we can't use that law but it's very good for the patient so if you have a Belgian claim always look first if you can use that law afterwards you get in the more difficult evidence uh, problems but if you can use that that law then you're good in Belgium. I imagine that's tricky with some of your breast implant cases because it's usually that 10 year mark or so where problems yes. can start to be clear, you know, so that's, yeah, a bit of a shame. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, yeah, again, just emphasizes that you, you shouldn't be Googling it. You, you need to go <laughs> and ask Shawnee um, exactly what's going to apply. And if indeed you might want to look at some alternative causes of action, it's going to be much more beneficial to you under the law. And something Cheryl mentioned um, a, a bit earlier that was about interrupting time. So if you realize it's Belgian law, you've realized, oh, I'm in time, but I'm running close to it. Is, is there, what's the best thing to do um, for, for interrupting time? I know Cheryl, you're a bit haunted by the issue, sir. Keeps me awake at night. Always sir. <laughs> so, but yeah, surely what it, it seems like in every European country, it's a slightly different way of, of doing that. Yeah, um, I think this serves the subpoena part just to for the so no, so the issue is like the claim form yeah and the services is actually sending it to the defendant so ah okay okay weird yeah <laughs> <laughs> no yeah I, I'm just going to talk about the subpoena I think that's a correct term in the UK correct me if I'm wrong is that so, a claim form equivalent is that 
I, I, that's that just like the, a, a the starting um, the yeah I've got a claim, got a claim. Okay, we, we, you don't send it to the court you send it to the um, bailiff the true yeah. so but this is why it's so interesting because there is no equivalent yeah, so you, yeah you, you sort of you, you, no. <clears throat> we need we need a bailiff to send it to the counterparty okay. and he will also send it to the court but we don't send it directly to the court you have some cases where you can in employment law but most of the cases start with a bailiff that goes to the counterparty yes yes uh you also have a specific letter that you can send but belgian lawyers don't like to use it because even if you send such a letter there's all, always discussion about was it clear enough? Is the um, is it lawful? Because we have like a very specific clause that everyone uses, but still, when we use it, and they can't use it against you to to say the the time limit is is passed, they will do it. So, the first discussion you will have before court is if if our clause was good enough to. Uh, yeah, start, interrupt mm -hmm. the, the limitation periods. So it's difficult and it's a risk. So we would like to, to ask the BAEF to, to do the subpoena, but it depends because sometimes you don't have all the evidence and you're not sure. And it is very, uh, it's, it's very expensive procedure in Belgium. So it depends, but we don't like the letter, but if it's necessary, it's necessary and we'll use it. I think that maps onto what Sarah was saying earlier that she, you know, even even if the other side agree at the time and say, yeah, yeah, we'll pause it, you know, it's always there's always the potential for that to go awry. So I suppose what I'm taking from you both is that if you can be certain, it's better to be certain. I think particularly as you say, Cheryl, with these kinds of clients who, you know, losing out that case on a mm -hmm. procedural point is not going to go down well. Absolutely not. And <laughs> you will feel when the full front of their back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, well, those are all of the kind of some of the factors Cheryl obviously thinks about when assessing prospects. But Shawnee, if Cheryl ends up having to advise her client, you know, I'm sorry, but actually you can only bring that claim in Belgium. One question we have wondered about is, is what kind of funding is going to be available for an English person who, who goes to bring a claim in Belgium? So obviously, here we have um, the sort of system where no no fee essentially for these kind of clients. And as long as there's prospects, you know, they're, they're not having to fork out straight away. So it kind of improves access for people in this position. Um, and I think Cheryl commented as well that often people doing this kind of, you know, they're going forward to save money on doing the surgery in England. So they're not going to have the deep pockets to redress the infringement of their rights. So what if, if, if any funding is going to be available? Um, to this poor English person who's now <laughs> battling with her Belgian <laughs> her her yeah, all those expenses well shocker but we don't have a lot of funding in Belgium we do have uh, a medical funding system but for cosmetic claims mm. it uh, doesn't count so if you get breast implants just to look prettier or you did a nose correction or something or and for it, serious business purposes okay. yeah then then they, then you can't go to the funding uh, then you can't ask for funding and the problem the problem with that is it's an organization so when you give your claim to them your lawyer can do anything anymore mm -hmm. so your yeah your your have now the organization doing their stuff for you but it takes like ages before you get some information or you know how they handled your case and if you get uh, some some damages or it's really difficult but it's only for purely medical negligence so not for cosmetic negligence and otherwise we do have a pro bono system for um yeah the the really poor UK, the Britons uh, that come to Belgium, they can ask for pro bono assistance, mm -hmm. but also there, there's a difference between 
the various cities in Belgium, how you can ask for those pro bono assistance because you have to fill in uh, a document that is only drafted in Dutch, French or German. So we don't have an English version of it. And uh, you have to have the minimum wages. And in those minimum wages, there's also like child support or um, if you get some um, medical um, <clears throat> support. No, um, if, you, if you're medical sick, fees, yeah, yeah, the, the fees, like, if you, like, like you're sick, then you get the expenses. That's in Belgium, it's the case. And when you're sick, there's the government who pays uh, some fees to you. And also that is considered as wages so when you got um some damage from a cosmetic claim in belgium you would have fees paid to you from the government and those also count mm -hmm. for getting the minimum wages yeah you can get over it and a lot of the patients receive too much money from our government mm -hmm. to get the minimum wages so even for oh, us, the, oh, <laughs> almost. So it's not, it's not always easy to get pro bono, but if you have uh, a client that is really, really, really low in, um, mm -hmm. in expenses, then you can get the pro bono assistance. And then also the uh, all the expert costs, the court costs and the bailiff will be paid by our government, in fact. Okay. So, so it is a good system. Once yeah, once you get it, it's it's really good. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to move you on now to Cheryl's decided. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take it. Here <laughs> we go. Um, and we're going to talk about that age-old question when we're looking at viability of what's the relevant standard here for my surgeon? What am I looking at? What, what am I trying to convince the course of? So, Shawnee, can you tell us if Cheryl's come to the conclusion that Belgian law is going to apply to her claim, um, what is the test for negligence we're going to be looking at? Yeah, I, I've never heard of the uh, UK test. So you have like a Bolanian? Yeah, or? to be fair, that was my, I wrote a little note for Shawnee. <laughs> Explain it to me, please. Totally on the money. <laughs> it looked very good today. <laughs> okay, right. It passed the shower Yeah, the Bolum test. It's called. Yeah. I used to call it Bolum test at university. For so far as I understood you, you make um, you just look at the surgeon and how other surgeons would do the same uh, operation or, or medical, um, yeah, procedure. Procedure, yeah. yes. <laughs> Sorry, no, yeah. the medical procedure. We had this discussion earlier that I'm supposed to be yeah. in the words. Of the <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in Belgium, it's a bit the same. So you will see, uh, we, we use the term uh, pater familias, a bonus pater familias, where you see if another surgeon in the same place doing the same surgery, if he would act the same as that surgeon. We do, and I'm going to repeat myself, but um, Belgian surgeons are educated in Belgian universities. And all of those universities have their own sp specific, uh, specific uh, yeah, uh, strategies. Like, uh, I'm searching for my words now. <laughs> <laughs> Like they give specific advice on here. No, the pro how you can do the procedures. That's oh, okay. what I'm looking for. So, um, for example, the university where I studied, they are specialized in liver transplantations, for example. So they have like specific rules and procedures that the Leuven educated surgeons will use. When the Brussels surgeons, there's also a university in Brussels, We'll have another special specialization and we'll have other procedures than Leuve. So even <laughs> the same surgeon in the same place, when he was educated somewhere else, can have other procedures he will follow um, that a medical expert only can 
yeah, look to if it's it, if it's met the standard that that university has put on their uh, university students. Uh, there's also um, in in cosmetic the cosmetic area. There is some laws. Um, no, it's not laws. It's not truly binding, but there are some. Uh, specific procedures they have to follow, but even then, it depends on which school they they use, and only a medical expert can see if it if the standard is met. Like we we already talked a bit, and I understood that you can just look into certain procedures and see if they were met. We need a medical expert to get a look at those procedures because the normal person and especially a patient will never know if a surgeon is using the right procedure or so it, still then we need those medical experts are so 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 important for us because as lawyers you just don't have access to any of that information not like the UK. So we still we still depend on the medical experts because yes, we um, didn't represent yeah. that we know all the <laughs> <laughs> But you we, can we, see we, it. Yeah, we, we look there at there are guidelines that as lawyers we can look to to get an, an idea as to whether mm -hmm. those guidelines have been followed. Um and there are things there, sort of never events. I had a case um, when I was a trainee where someone left um four steps inside a person and you probably shouldn't be it, it should go without saying, but it's actually in the guidelines that should not happen. So, and it did. Um, <laughs> but even with the guidelines, you'll sometimes need an expert. Mm -hmm. Well, you will always need an expert. Um, but the guidelines just give you an idea. It gives you um, some reassurance that it's worth looking into. Yeah, it, it gives you an idea if it's worth to bring the case yeah. to court. Because for us, it's mm -hmm. always... Yeah, yeah, just uh, <laughs> part of what you talk, when you, you were so surprised when we told you about this. The yeah, I was. The, the standards you've been talking about are not publicly available in Belgium, but kept within the walls of mm -hmm. the university. <clears throat> Whereas for us, at least we can go and have a look, you know, what does NICE say about this and, and get some sense of what they're supposed to be doing. And equally, for us, you know, in our extra <clears throat> experts' reports, if they can point to a guideline that's been breached, that's always nice and reassuring for you because you're not just relying on their opinion, they're saying it's here in black and white so yeah another really substantial difference and i think shows that in belgium to get even the right medical expert again you have to be looking at where specifically the surgery has happened where were they trained mm -hmm. and everything so again really needed the, the guidance of a, of a belgian lawyer um to do that for you um cheryl if english law in mm -hmm. fact applies to to our claim <laughs> What's the standard against which our surgeon is likely to be judged? What what are we looking at here? That's a great question because it brings us back to one of the factors <laughs> <laughs> that we skipped over at the beginning. Is um, some of these cases um, are brought pursuant to package travel regulations, mm -hmm. and so you'll have that um, framework of English law with local standards applying and looking at um, evidence from a medical practitioner in the country where it happened. If you've got because um, there are cases where you'll establish that it is. An English contract. So there's still a, there's still a question about local standards in terms of how who are the peers against whom the surgeon mm -hmm. should be judged. And so you're going to always need an eye on actually what the, what the practice is there. But there are some practitioners, could use different words, um, who promote themselves as being um, GMC registered, offering the same qualities you would expect in England. It's just as if you're in England. It just happens to be in. A sunny country that begins with tea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if you're lucky, you know, you'll, you'll go home on a plane. Um, that's only the bad side of things that I, I just want to, you know, we are being recorded. So um, <laughs> that's, just, that's just the things that we see. Um, but yeah, they make themselves out to um, carry out surgeon as a surgery as if you're in England. And so we will hold them to that standard um, and obtain evidence from English surgeons as to what that standard is. And whether they are indeed complying with it. Mm -hmm. So it just shows the importance of trawling through that website, oh, yeah. all the documentation, <clears throat> you know, is that going to be there? Um, yeah, really, really important. Um, and I think another thing you, you mentioned in our prep was just that generally the standard in Belgium does seem to be very high, mm. you know, which is obviously a reason why people are attracted to it. So that's at least a, a positive yeah. note. That, um, and I think that goes back to what Shawnee was saying about the specific specialisms mm -hmm. and the very specific standards that apply to that. Um, it's just unfortunate that that sort of 
message isn't so much in the public arena because if you want a specific surgery and there's a place in Belgium where a surgeon has to study to get the you know the gold mm-hmm. standard um, then it's a lot simpler to just choose a surgeon from that place um, mm. but yeah they're, they're very very specific and it does seem quite high and there is a there are a lot of people going to Belgium as, as the internet has told us yeah. um, and not all of them are, are coming to us so yeah. they're obviously getting good treatment as well. Mm-hmm. And um, okay, so moving on, I guess, to the to the final bit, we've, we've got a liability, we've got a case in England that's lovely. Belgian law is going to apply to the assessment of damages. Um, Shawnee, it's it's always interesting um, for English lawyers to learn what you know what the quirks of how the Belgian approach is going to work to that assessment of damages. Um, and, and so could you just give us a brief little little guide on that? <laughs> yeah, for damages, we, we don't have like uh laws that are enforceable to, to get our damages. Well, like I understood in, in England, it is much more... So the guidelines. Then. Yeah, we have guidelines, but I thought here in England it was um, based in, in the law, how you how you could do it. But, well, um, yeah, there's like a specific kind of starting point of, well, it's, you know, but okay. for this, I, I wouldn't have suffered all of this. <laughs> but it's enforceable in, 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 in the UK. So I think I understand it mm-hmm. right. But in Belgium, we just have like an indicative uh, table mm-hmm. that we can use. And in fact, it's not um, a law. So it's not enforceable. But we know in case law, the judges will follow uh, the indicative uh, table. And um, we must have a report from an expert that gives all, already all the possible damages and percentages from um, temporary damages to um, damages in the future. And all of that, we, we get it in the medical report and with that medical report we use the indicative table and then we can make a report on what the damages will be with without an expert in okay, belgium so you, you can the, make the medical, um, here's what happens yeah. is you, then the lawyers are able to interpret that and apply the table yes. so you don't have that special kind of medical legal interim person that no do no we, we we need a uh, medical report and with that report, we can do the damages. Uh, we can we can calculate the damages, mm-hmm. but the counterparty will also make mm-hmm. the same medical report, but in their advance, because yeah, medical ev- experts are neutral, but yes. not in fact. So you have two medical report, reports, two uh, different calculations, and then the court will yeah, decide which one or even a third one that they make out of those two medical reports. I think that's yeah, the, the a report, lot of times the case. The reports I've seen is sort of look at percentage of temporary permanent disability, um, whether you are prejudiced on the labour market and a sort of percentage mm-hmm. base. And then mm-hmm. and are the arguments, do they tend to be on the, the sort of number of days and percentages as well as what the lawyers think should be assigned in terms of money to those percentages, or is the biggest area between the medical experts? The medical experts have a lot of um, persuasion before the court. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I use the, the right word, but the court will likely follow the medical experts more than the lawyers. So when we make our calculations, yeah, they're based on the medical expert uh, reports, but the law, the judge will first look at the two different medical reports before they will look at our calculations. So I think they prefer the medical reports first, and when they decided on the medical report that they will, that they will use, they will look at our calculations. So I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> And it sounds certainly like when you're giving your foreign law expert evidence, you're going to want to address then that this isn't binding, but every court, you know, applies it and uses it. Because that's mm-hmm. sort of the gap sometimes that we fall down as well. If the other side can point to something and say, oh, actually, that's not binding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Great. Well, that's you've taken us from am I going to take it to yes, I'm taking it. What's the standard and, and what am I getting? Are there any last words or top tips from you um, in terms of managing these claims before I open you up to questions? Cheryl's like, I've given all my tips. <laughs> Just <laughs> speak to <laughs> speak to your expert. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us.